Good morning. Good morning. All right, I get to I get to do Romans. Yeah. I love uh, anything Paul teaches on. Man, is awesome. Um, you know, they were singing that song, God's still the same today as he was yesterday, and he hasn't changed a bit. God, God is still the same. You know, we, we get up here and we preach grace, but God was grace in the Old Testament as much as he is in the New Testament. Yeah. Um, God has not changed. He just made a better way. Yeah. That's all he did. He's not changed one bit. He's still a holy God. He's still a, the God that sits on the throne. He's the creator of everything. He's the, he's the Lord God Almighty. Um, he has not changed one bit. He just, like I said, he made a better way. He made a better way for each and every one of us today. We don't have to do what they had to do back then. Thank goodness we don't have to sacrifice animals and we don't have to do that all the time. Every time we mess up, we don't have to lay something down, a sacrifice down, because it's already been sacrificed once for all of us. Thank you, Jesus, for that. We're going to read Romans 3. I'm just going to, we don't have a whole lot of time to do this, so there's a few things I want to get into Romans 3 with. So I'm just going to kind of go through here. I'm going to read the whole chapter, the whole verse, I mean, and then I'm going to point out some things in here as I do. Uh, chapter th Romans chapter 3. Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if, if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way, by no means. For then, how could God judge the world? Hey, Ron, can you turn that down a little bit? Um, how could God judge the world? Okay, you look at that verse and you're like, man, that's kind of a scary verse, right? You know, how can God judge the world? Because we've always been told that God is ready to judge you. He's ready to pour out His wrath on you. He's ready. If you do something wrong, He's there to punish you. He's, you know, that's the way I was taught growing up. And I know there's probably a lot of you guys in here that was taught the same thing or that's what you remember. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean you were taught that, but that's what you remember because that was what was emphasized the most. If you don't do this, you know, uh, you got to live this way, you got to live that way. So when you see this word here and it says, God's going to judge the world. Okay, so first off, as a Christian, we're judged differently than the world. First and foremost, we're not judged the same way the world is judged. Okay, he's, there's two different kinds of judgment here. One year, when you're a Christian, you're judged according to Jesus Christ. So I'm going to go back to Psalms. Let's go over to Psalms and look at something. Psalms 96. And I want you guys to see something. This is pretty neat. Because even in Psalm in, nine, in, in, in the Old Testament, they were rejoicing because of judgment. So 96, 11 through 13. And it said, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Man, they're talking about judgment and they're being, let the earth rejoice. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then, or let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Man, they're singing for joy over being judged. There before the Lord, for He comes, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the prophets in faithfulness. So they're, they're excited. I mean, how can you be excited when you're talking about judgment? Because they knew. They knew that their righteous judgment was going to be because of Jesus. Yeah, come on. The same way that we are. We can be joyful and we can... When someone says something about judgment, you should be like, yes. Yes, I'm going to be judged. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you should smile. It shouldn't make you feel like, oh man, I'm going to be judged. No, come on, throw a party. Yeah. You're going to be judged because of what Jesus did, not because of what you did. That's not, our judgment comes from what Jesus did, not because of what we did. Yeah. And this is why they were rejoicing. This is why they were happy because they knew. They knew what was coming. So it was just, it was awesome to see that even in Psalm where they were rejoicing and throwing a party because they, of a judgment. And most people don't get happy when they talk about judgment. I mean, when I was in front of the judge, I wasn't happy. 
I knew what was going to happen because of what I did. Nobody was going to take my place for that. But Jesus took our place. He took our place of judgment. So we can be happy. We can throw a party. We can be excited about that when someone speaks about judgment. All right, let's go back to Romans. And it says, But if through my lie God's truth abounds to His glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying their condemnation is just. Now it gets good, guys. And it says, I know it's not going to sound good at first. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Man, sounds kind of rough, don't it? Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And then it says, now. Now. Right now. Right now. This is now. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Are you under the law today? Absolutely not. We are under grace. Does that mean that the law is no longer, it's not like it's not there anymore. It's just we're not under that. We're under under grace. We're under Jesus Christ. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. The Old Testament was the law. The New Testament is grace. A lot of times we try to mix those two and it's not a mixture. you got to rightly divide where we're at. We're no longer under the law. We're under grace. So what happens a lot of times is we, we try to mix those two things up. And then what we do is we cause confusion. And then people get confused. Well, am I under law or under my grace? Am I supposed to do this or did God do this? Um, do I have to live this way in order to be good enough for God or did Jesus do it all for me? See, it becomes confusion. And that's not what God intended. God's not a God of confusion. He's a God of truth. So we have to rightly divide what the Word says. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. So he's telling you right there, if you're... If you're going to do this according to the works of the law, you'll never be justified. No one. Not one is good enough. If that's what you want to base your life on, is the works of what you do, the law, then you're never going to be justified. When you stand before God and He says, well, what did you do? And you give Him this big old list of things, you're not going to be justified. Now, if you get in front of God and you say, Jesus, He's going to say, come on in. Because that's what we're going to be justified. That's what we're justified on is Jesus Christ. Right. Not on our works, not on who, what we do, not on how great we are or how good we are, or all the good works we do, or I did this for that person or this person. No, you're not going to be. That's not what justifies you. And the whole world will be held accountable to God for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So how do they know that they ever sinned? How do you know you sin? Because they were given the law. So the law brings about the knowledge of sin. If there was no law, you would never know that you even sinned. You would never even know it. You know, you would go on through life. Um, The reason why Adam and Eve knew that they had sinned because God had given them a strict thing. Do not eat from the tree. But if God would have never said that, they would have never sinned, right? Because they would have never known what was right and what was wrong. So the law brings forth the knowledge of sin. And what that does is it it stays in your mind. So you're always thinking about the law. You're always thinking about how I got to do this or how I got to do that to be good enough. Um, I got to keep this law today, which is good. I'm not saying that that's not good to do those things, but your focus isn't on Jesus Christ when you do that. Your focus becomes all on your law and what you're doing so much that you forget about Jesus Christ, the one who's going to change you. Because 
You can sit there and focus on all that other stuff, and I promise you that'll take control of your life. But if you'll just focus on Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, your life will change without you even knowing it. And this, you know, I, I had Morgan read this scripture this morning. And I know you guys are probably thinking, man, that wasn't good news. Uh, for, all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why was that the scripture I gave him this morning? Because I guarantee you, 99% of you all, that's the one scripture that you know in Romans 3. Yeah. I mean, everybody in here probably knows that scripture better than any other scripture in Romans chapter 3, or maybe even Romans altogether. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, I, I touched on this a little bit last night. This is what happens. We pick out certain scriptures and we base everything on that scripture. We don't take it in the context that it was written in. And we will live off of that one scripture and not what was written before it and after it. Paul had a whole, this is a whole letter right here. He's speaking it all at one time. He's not taking this one scripture and saying, I'm going to do a ser sermon out of this one scripture. But that's what we do. I mean, you guys, everybody in here can pick out one scripture that they know that they've heard over their lifetime. And it, it's probably not even going to be a good one. It's not even the good news. This is not the good news for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If that's what I preached today and everybody left here, they would all be like, mm, I'm not good enough. And I had Morgan say that, that verse because I wanted you guys to know that's what most of us in here probably remember about this chapter. But today, don't leave here remembering that. I'm going to show you why. It's not about for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No, it's not even what he's talking about here. But we have, like I said, we have taken that scripture and that's the one thing we will, like he said, it's written on our walls. We got pictures. You can probably go to, uh, what's that, Hobby Lobby place and probably find a plaque that says that on there. Come on, you want that in your house? That's not good news. I'm going to wake up every morning and I want to read this. For I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Come on, for real. Does that even make any sense? Now let's read it in the context that it was wrote in. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Let's go over to Matthew. Chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 1. And it said, After six days Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, let me explain something real quick. So there's Jesus, Moses, and Elijah up on the mountain, right? So Jesus is grace. He represents grace. Moses represents the law, in case you guys don't know that. And Elijah represents the prophets. So what I was talking about in Romans a while ago, they was talking about law and the prophets. But listen to what Jesus says here. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are, our, that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when behold... A bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. He didn't say listen to Moses. He didn't say listen to Elijah. As a matter of fact, right after this, Moses and Elijah are gone. And it's just Jesus. God said listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus and Jesus only. Yeah. Don't listen to the law. Don't listen to the prophets. I mean, it's great to get a word spoke over your life, but the word is speaking over your life every time you open up the Bible. Yeah. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus Christ. Let him talk to you. That's just because because right here it says, but now, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Apart from the law. The righteousness of God, which is Christ Jesus. 
has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The law and the prophets, they bear witness to it. They were there on the mountain, right? Yeah. They witnessed God saying, listen to Jesus. Listen to grace. Listen to what Jesus has to say. It's not about the law and the prophets. It's about Jesus. Listen to what he has to say. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. Now here's what I'm talking about. So this next scripture we talk about. 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is Paul talking about here? He's talking about in the scripture before that, he says there's no distinction. He's just saying that everybody is on the same playing field. Yeah. Jews, Greeks, Gentiles, everybody, they're all on the same playing field. Everybody is on the same playing field. That's all he's saying right here. Nobody's better than anyone else. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's all he's saying right here. He's not saying you have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No, he's saying everybody's equal. Everybody's on the same playing field. And everybody can receive Jesus Christ. Everybody has the same, everyone is, has the same ability to receive Jesus Christ as anyone else. Not one person is better than the next person. It's not like God said, well, you're a Jew, you can accept Jesus, but you're a Greek, you can't. No. Everybody's on the same playing field. All have sinned and fall short of the glory because they're all on the same playing field. That's what he's talking about here. He's not saying, he's not pointing out Chad and saying, man, you sin, you fall short of the glory of God. No, he's saying everybody's on the same playing field. Everybody's together in this. Everybody is the same person, but everyone can receive. Listen to what he says next. This is awesome. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. So we stop at all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but it says, and are justified, justified by His grace as a gift. So we're all on the same playing field and we're all got the ability to receive the same gift of grace. Every one of us. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about we're all on the same playing field. We still all have the same. We're all starting at the same spot. Yeah. Every one of us. And we all have the ability to receive the gift of grace. So it's, it's those things that I'm talking about. We take the context of a scripture and we run with it. And we base our whole who we are and everything else on that one scripture. And we will beat ourselves up over that. If we left here today, and that was the only scripture I read, and I preached on that scripture alone, everybody in here would walk out with their head down thinking they're not good enough. That's not good news. That's the bad news. And I don't know about you, but I like reading the good news of the gospel yeah. of Jesus Christ. Um, like I said, even in the Old Testament, God's still the same as he was then. He just made a better way for us. He made it easier for us. All we have to do now is just accept Jesus Christ. And we're justified because of that. We're righteous because of Jesus Christ. We're forgiven because of Jesus Christ. And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a perpetuation by His blood to be received by faith. How do you receive this? Faith. By, be, by believing in Jesus Christ. It's that simple. There's no uh, rules that you have to keep. There's no laws you have to keep. Just have faith that Jesus Christ did it for you. That's it right there. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbear forbearance He had passed over former sins. That's awesome. Passed over former sins, present sins, future sins, all of them. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our bo boasting? It is excluded. But what kind of law? By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Absolutely not. And that's what Paul mentioned too. We're all on the same playing field. Thank you, Jesus, that he made that available. Yes. 
Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by, his, by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So it doesn't mean that you can just go out and do whatever you want to. Um, if anybody ever gets that conclusion from what we preach here that we're telling you to go out and do whatever you want to, absolutely not. That is not what we're saying at all. If that was the case, we, I believe in Jesus Christ with all my heart. I love God. I have a relationship with God. I'd be doing that whatever I wanted to right now. But I don't. Because I love God. Because I have that relationship with God. And when you have a relationship with someone, you want to do whatever it takes to please that person. And in order to have that relationship, you have to know who you are and who God is. The only way to do that is to get into His presence. Jesus made it available for us to get into His presence. He opened, that, he opened up that curtain for us to be able to come in and to come in without any guilt or shame. See, that's what grace does. It allows you to come in without guilt and shame. So you can come into the presence of God and you can speak to God and you can say, God, I love you. Thank you for the love that you have for me. And not be, man, I didn't do good enough today. It's not about that stuff, guys. It's about getting into the presence of God. And once you get into the presence of God, everything else will change in your life. The law will be kept because your, your whole countenance will change. You'll change who you are. Just that's what you have to focus on. Focus on getting into the presence of God. Focus on getting into the presence of Jesus. If you will remember to keep all these things first, keep Jesus first in everything, that opens up the door for you to come in. So today, if you're not in that place where you feel like you're worthy of God, Jesus says, because of what Jesus did, you are. Come into that place. Come up to the cross. Come up and spend time with God as we worship.